Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will be discussing best practices in metadata management with sponsored today by Irwin. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A panel, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. To open the chat on the Q&A panels, you will find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and recordings of this session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Monique for a brief word from our sponsor, Erwin. Monique, hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Thank you, Shannon and Dataversity for allowing us to be here today and welcome everyone from Portland, Oregon. Um, I am also personally looking forward to hearing from Donna on this topic, uh, but I'd like to share with you just a few thoughts on metadata management from Erwin's perspective before we get started. For those of you that may not know Erwin, uh, Erwin is a two-time Gartner Magic Quadrant leader in the metadata management space, and we help hundreds of organizations every day to capture, take advantage of, and fully leverage the metadata within their organizations in order to capitalize on the value of the data that they have with, across the enterprise, as well as protect against its risk. Don is gonna get into much more detail around metadata management and what it provides. But in a nutshell, according to Gartner, metadata really is any data within your organization that's used to enhance the usability, comprehension, utility, or functionality of the data that you have. And metadata management solutions, in essence, provide that data in context um, for you. So some of the things that, that metadata management helps you to uh, understand about your data is, again, the data that you have, where it comes from, how it's used, and how it flows and changes throughout your organization. Uh, considerations that you need to be aware of, such as the accuracy of the data that you have and the sensitivity that you need to protect um, against who is accountable for the data that you own, and when empowering users, what rules and restrictions should you have in place in order to ensure that they appropriately leverage the data? Um, and lastly, what can you capture regarding uh, data knowledge within your organizations that others outside of IT may know and can share to help uh, further increase the data literacy within your organizations? Effective metadata management solutions really enable enterprise data visibility, automation, governance, and collaboration across your entire organization. And they do this by bringing in the technical metadata throughout uh, your organization that's associated with your technical data elements into a central data, a metadata repository. Um, effective metadata management solutions give you the tools to automatically discover and harvest this information bringing it into the, the metadata repository, and then be able to curate that information with addi additional details uh, regarding uh, technical um, characteristics, business uh, characteristics, and um, data fitness characteristics to provide a fuller context of the data that you have at hand. If it's integrated with, a, with governance capabilities, metadata management solutions can also then help you to curate um, all of your, your metadata uh, or to govern the curated metadata that you have within your organizations, um, helping to manage the data stewardship, stewardship process, attaching ownership, attaching data classification, and managing uh, the rules and policies that you put in place in order to ensure that as business users are using the data, that they're using it appropriately, um, as well as within context of, of understanding um, what is available to them. Effective metadata management solutions these days don't only store uh, metadata within a central repository, but they also activate the metadata to get rid of, of a lot of the, the previously manual processes and, and be able to generate different uh, data discovery artifacts, um, such as data lineage, impact analysis, or knowledge graphs, such as the one that you see on the screen which give a, make it easy for business users and others throughout the organization 
clearly understand the data assets that are available before them and how it relates to both the technical data within the organization and other, other relationships that there may be uh, within the business asset um, storage that you have. Um, additionally, metadata management can also be, or metadata within the metadata repository can also be activated in best of class solutions in order to drive other development processes and shorten the delivery time in order to empower business users. And lastly, uh, efficient metadata management solutions and effective effective uh, should effectively also socialize the content within the metadata management solution with your business user community and be able to promote uh, and encourage crowdsourced uh, data knowledge from your community back into the data governance team and into uh, the IT side of the house as well. So why has metadata management traditionally been difficult in the past? Really at the core of it, a lot of these processes have been very manual in terms of, of data discovery and ingestion uh, within a central repository. Um, and additionally, a lot of the artifacts that we discussed, such as data lineage, impact analysis, uh, knowledge graphs, uh, were manual as well in order of, of being able to share that information and to keep the information, the metadata current, um, limited the reach of the, the currency of the data that, that you were sharing at large. Most metadata management solutions on the market today have a level of standard data connector um, uh, offering that is available to help to automate um, the, the ingestion of metadata harvesting into the metadata repository. And so, so most do have some sort of ability to be able to harvest data at rest, metadata from common industry data sources um, into the metadata repository at this point. They may differ in their approach of how they do that. Some providers may choose to work with external parties um, that specialize in, in connectors and outsource the library of connectors that they, they offer, whereas others may dwell and may, may use their internal professional services expertise in order to provide tighter integration and maybe more um, easy release compatibility as well uh, and providing their own offering. But most do have some level of standard data connector to help you automatically ingest uh, the data at rest from the technical data assets across your organization. Uh, what is new, I think, or, or evolving really is this class of smart data connectors. And those are connectors that leverage a much more advanced framework for automation and allow you to not only capture the the more common data at rest met metadata, but additionally data at rest from sources that may be more complex in nature, as well as data in motion across your, your organization that you may be um, seeing via ET or tra being transformed via ETL or other processes. And by allowing the ability to be able to capture this, this more complex data, um, you're able to provide your organization which, with a much more complete uh, view of your data landscape in its entirety, as well as more easily maintain and keep it, keep it current. Additionally, smarter data connectors uh, are able to as well not only um, get, help you get the metadata into the repository, but additionally activate that metadata to drive development processes um, to be able to, to streamline um, the development of new data pipelines or help you uh, manage cloud migration and, and get from a uh, current state to a future state much more quickly through co-generation and such. This is really uh, what's changed with metadata management. Um, you know, Gartner recently released a, a research report as well that said, basically, in essence, metadata management solutions are rapidly becoming more focused on what you can do actively with metadata rather than solely how much you can store within a metadata repository. And so examples like that on the screen uh, give you an give you an idea of the types of things that you can leverage metadata for in order to really drive farther, greater insight and new efficiency across your organization relative uh, to the data that you have. So what should you look for in a best-in-class metadata management solution? We've suggested a, a few different items here um, that I'll let you take a look at, but at the highest level, I think that, that I would advise that you concentrate on three primary areas. 
One, the depth and breadth of the metadata harvesting automation available to you, both from uh, data at rest, uh, data in motion, as well as potentially metadata that you're collecting already within the data models that you are working with. Um, and how that automation as well is provided to not only help you ingest the metadata, but to actually uh, use it to be able to de deliver uh, and map your, your data landscape and deliver more data discovery um, uh, tools to help you understand your, your data landscape. Two, um, what types of drill down uh, visualizations or data discovery aids are you able to provide across your organization, such as data lineage, impact analysis, or knowledge graphs that help people to really understand and discover quickly what is available um, and then understand how to use it or how to protect it as they use it. Uh, we are all being asked for increased um, you know, proof of ROI for investments that we, that we ask for within a business context and being able to ensure that the metadata management solution that you're choosing um, makes it very easy for users, whether they're in IT, data governance, or they're in the business community at large or risk and compliance, for instance, as well, to be able to quickly drill down, see and understand what's available to them um, is going to be important to help you increase your data literacy quickly and provide the ROI uh, for different projects that you may be, may be looking at and to be able to see that impact in decision making. And then lastly, metadata management solutions on the market today come from a variety of perspectives. Some come from a deep IT perspective, um, some come from a, a more of a business perspective and then have added IT uh, capabilities later on. It's important as you take a look at the solutions available that you really evaluate across the board what is the best fit for both IT and the business community together. Uh, is it speaking to IT needs, data governance needs, and business needs in one offering? Um, the last thing that, that any of us needs is, is to provide yet another siloed view of our data landscape or our siloed siloed repository um, that only one side of the organization is using, especially where, when we're in the midst of trying to pursue that vision of a single source enterprise view of uh, the data and the, the truths that are available to your organization. So I'd suggest that you uh, consider carefully how does it represent and address the needs of each of the communities, uh, despite who, who initiates the search to begin with. So with that, thank you for allowing me to share just a few thoughts from Irwin's perspective. If you'd like to learn more about Irwin Data Intelligence by Quest, which is our metadata management solution, or to download a copy of the latest Gartner Magic Quadrant Metadata Management Solutions Assessment to Review All, all Solutions, please visit us at irwin.com. Uh, and again, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Shannon and Donna, and I look forward to the rest of the presentation. Monique, thank you so much for this great presentation. And if you have questions for Monique about Erwin, she will be hanging out and answering questions in the Q&A portion at the end of today's presentation. And thanks to Erwin for helping to make these webinars happen. And now let me introduce uh, the speaker of the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the managing director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to begin her presentation. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon and uh, Dataversity crew. It's always nice to see some of the regular faces and names on the on the chat. So um, we have a rich, robust uh, schedule ahead of us. So I want to jump right in. Um, as you know, if anyone's been on my sessions before, metadata management is near and dear to my heart. I sort of grew up in metadata before it was hit. So I'm finally glad that it's coming to the forefront. Um, and as Monique mentioned, there's just a lot of interest in metadata now. Uh, just as I often say, if this is the first uh, webinar series you have attended, um, be it known that there's a, an entire series. We do this every month. Everything is on demand at Dataversity. So if any of those in the past were of interest to you, you can catch the replay, not only on the um, Dataversity site, but we also post them on our global data strategy. We have a link as well. Uh, next month, just a call out to uh, data quality, 
which is sort of the cousin um, to um, metadata. Um, and uh, we can uh, have our guest, Nigel Turner, who uh, he's often a popular uh, speaker who joins us a couple times a year. So um, please help uh, join again if, if, if that's of interest to you. So what, right into it, what we're going to cover today. So as Monique mentioned, metadata is hotter than ever. Um, Data Diversity has done so, some surveys. This is always a popular topic when we have a discussion on it. And I think it's, it's multifaceted from the business value and the kind of the business stakeholders, um, as well as the technical side. And um, Monique touched on that as well. A lot of reasons for that. Some is just that metadata has business value. Some are things like industry regulation. I think either of those really needs that better transparency and understanding of information. Even when we get into things like AI and big data and all of that, you still need the metadata behind it. Uh, metadata has been around for a very long time, um, but there are new ways of looking at it, some new strategies and approaches that we can talk about. Um, and then how do you map your metadata strategy and kind of into a wider data strategy? And, and the ultimate goal is how do you provide business value, which is always a theme in these webinars. Uh, so we'll jump right into that. So um, many of you are familiar with our framework at Global Data Strategy. Um, which really provides this kind of menu, I guess, of, of items you really need to make data sing and be successful in your organization. Everything should align with the business strategy um, and the data strategy and can both inform and support the business strategy. Metadata, as you can see in the lower right, is key to all of that. I mean, what's uh, sort of fun, but also frustrating about this framework is that no matter what lens you look at sort of the Rubik's cube of data, um, you, you can sort of start at metadata and then broaden out because data, metadata is part of a data architecture. It supports quality, it supports analytics and BI is a key part of governance, right? Or you could start with governance and say, okay, we're starting with governance and metadata is key to that. So they really are all sort of joined together and each one is a full discipline in and of itself. And we try in this webinar series to try to do a deep dive on each of these as much as possible. And today's topic is metadata. And we'll be, we'll be diving into that, but also in the context of how it supports these other areas. So what is metadata? Metadata, as I like to, to term it, and I'm glad everyone kind of picked up on that as well, um, is metadata is data in context. Um, one of my many pet peeves in life, <laughs> I often use this, this soapbox to rant about data issues, but um, is that metadata is such an intuitive thing. It's such a helpful thing. And then we pick this really nerdy um, obfuscating word called metadata. Um, and I think that does ourselves a disservice. And then uh, I will not have this in the presentation. I will say it but once. Um, when, we, when people say, what is metadata? We'll say something like, metadata is data about data, as if that doesn't make it even more complex. So uh, feel, you, feel free to use that if you wish. I try to avoid that. I just feel like we're sort of playing games with people when we use complex terms for a really obvious uh, context. So I like to say metadata is data in context, that makes sense. And then I jump right into examples because generally metadata is fairly intuitive. So um, uh, many of you I've seen folks kind of leverage this uh, matrix I've put together um, and it's just so simple. It's sort of the Zockman framework of, <laughs> of metadata, I guess, who, what, where, why, when, and how. Um, and these are some examples of, you know, often in, in metadata, we focus sort of on the what, We'll talk about business what, which is the business definitions, business context, business rules, um, but it can also be kind of the technical what, uh, data types, um, et cetera. Who is super important? We'll talk about that a little bit as it relates to governance. Who's the data steward? Who's the owner? Who's regulating it? Who's auditing it? Who are the business users? Who's interested? So much in each one of these. Where in terms of where is the data stored? We're looking at lineage. We're looking at Looking at compliance, is it in Europe or the US? And are there certain who uh, that, that, that matters to? Um, why? Gosh, I wish we all started with that one. <laughs> why are we storing this data? I mean, some more and more companies are realizing that one um, of my customers said, I, I'm stealing it because it was brilliant. It was, you know, some of this data is just toxic waste. <laughs> Do we need to keep it? Do we need to keep all of our customer sensitive information? Or is that too much of a risk? You know, what's the value compared to the storage risk? Not only in terms of, you know, the storage in terms of bits and bytes and volume, but in terms of risk um, and auditability. Or what's the business drivers? Let's focus, no one can focus on anything. And, and Monique touched on that, that, you know, with these tools, actually they, some of those tools have been around for decades now that you can scan the data in 
Um, and and I, I see that some of these tools are so slick, it's really easy to get carried away and scan in everything or, or try to define every single business data element in the planet. Um, please don't do that. <laughs> it's probably a whole lot better to focus on the, those data elements that are offering the most business value and, and get those right, get those in context and make it easy for people to find and then, then move on. And that really ties into governance that we'll touch on a little bit. The when, super important, when was it created? How long should it be stored? When should it be purged? Retention rules. Um, and then the how, I think, is, is kind of like the what, you know, the core, you know, how is it formatted? How many data stores, et cetera, et cetera. So um, hopefully this is a helpful context of the data and context um, that you can kind of use. And, and it is multifaceted. Um, some people, um, you know, when they're thinking of metadata, they think of the business definitions and they're right. Um, some people correctly think of it as the technical definitions or the lineage in there right as well. So uh, rather than argue, we sort of are inclusive and embraceive of all of that. So um, what is metadata? Just a couple more examples. Um, data versus metadata. This could be a, a, a fun party trick too. Some people's data is other people's metadata. And again, you can go crazy. But um, if you just think of a database almost as a spreadsheet, <laughs> um, just as totally simplify, and you had a simple spreadsheet of names and addresses in, in your company or retail store, um, the, the names, the actual, the fact that Joe Smith bought a computer at Computers R Us in New York um, and purchased it in 1970, that's the data. The metadata is that Joe represents the first name, Smith is the last name. Okay, and that might seem boring, but it's something like a year. Is that the year it was purchased? Did they have computers back then? Or is that the year that Joe was born, perhaps? Is that a metadata issue? Is it a data issue? I mean, that's the type of stuff that really can make or break a, a business intelligence campaign. Um, and and I, will, I will use this soapbox to share some of my stories and of, of metadata issues. And we could have, gosh, a whole week, a whole week conference on metadata horror stories, right? No, but I think that we all have them and, and what's so frustrating about them, it's such a simple thing. Could you just put instead of year, you're born, you're purchased, you became a loyalty customer and um, you know just write it down. <laughs> Someone said once, you know, metadata is sort of a gift to yourself or a gift to somebody else 10 years later. Um, and that really is important. So easy to do, but so valuable when you do it. Um, so there's often more even in, into this context, you know, see something as simple as, um, you know, last name, what is that? Is that uh, the surname or family name? But in, in some markets that actually is, is the other way around that what we call the last name is what in the West we call the first name, et cetera. Something like city, is that the city where, where Joe Smith lives or the city where the store is located or, you know, so that we go crazy, but just getting that simple context can be so valuable and that is metadata. Um, I, I will focus a lot on the business value of metadata and kind of the business metadata. Sometimes that is the biggest value. Um, I often tell this story when I, I was a young and, and one of my first um, big metadata um, implementations was one of the big Wall Street banks uh, on Wall Street. And I, I had one of the biggest, slickest tools at the time. And I wanted to get all the cool technical debt metadata in. Um, and the project manager at the time said, just build a glossary, you know, define what a default credit swap is. And seriously, we've all, I was, I was really angry. I remember storming out of the building once and st stomping my way home um, because I wanted to do the cool stuff. But long term, he was right because we got the buy-in from the business. All the traders went to the glossary because that's where they needed to know all these different uh, tools they had. And then later we linked it to everything and we had a full lineage and it was one of the, actually the biggest uh, metadata implementations of, I've ever done. And we got to the tech but we got to the tech by starting with the business. And that was kind of a good lesson for me to remember. You know, often the business of course gets it more than IT. I often feel I have to argue with IT to do it <laughs> and business can't understand how you can work without it. Um, something, and this was a survey from uh, Dataversity a while back, we did a survey of metadata um, and 80% of the users were sort of from the business and they really saw that, you know, how can you function without it? I remember once I was doing a business case to our executive sponsor of the project and it was from finance. We went through the whole long presentation of why you need the context of data and why you need the lineage and, and how this report was calculated. And she looked at us funny and said, I mean, you're not doing that? Like, that's really scary. She said, we couldn't get away with that in finance. <laughs> I don't know where our money comes from. We just have some in the bank. Um, so I think now that data is becoming more of a, an asset and people are realizing that it's always been an asset, but people are realizing it. We have to have more rigor around how we're managing it, uh, which I think is a good thing. Um, so again, something as simple as, if you think of the person um, earlier, something like how was total sales figures 
calculated. And that's why sometimes you do sound like a crazy person when you talk about metadata. You know, what did you do? I went through a little tweet storm a while back of, you know, during the day, what, what did I do? You know, I spent all day defining um, what a country was or what a flavor was or what a product was. And then, and, you know, you come home at night. So what did you do? Well, I defined what, what, you know, a region is and people think you're strange. Now, how complicated can that be? Um, but it can be. So something like total sales that seems on the surface so simple, but there's a lot of nuance to that. Show me customers by region. Now, if you're a good data architect or a metadata architect or a business analyst, et cetera, if you're like me, <laughs> or have been around the block, gosh, some of those words right away can trigger you. What's a customer? What's a region? Um, or does that include lapsed customers? You know, how do we define what's lapsed if they haven't paid their maintenance for six months? Is that lapsed? How do you find a region? Gosh, that can be really political. What do we define a country? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all that context around such a simple report. And the business person can get frustrated. Gosh, how, how hard can that be? Until you start explaining. Uh, some of those nuance, and then generally people jump right in and understand. Um, my, my request to everyone on this call or anyone on the planet, please, please avoid the what I call that, the I just know. Um, and some of us, again, it seems so obvious. So think of back to that, that spreadsheet where it said, you know, uh, name, date, and location. Gosh, I don't, I just know how hard is that? It's the location of the store. Well, when you retire 20 years later, does someone know that that was the location of the store? Um, or is that the location of the customer? Like that's that's a very big difference. Uh, and and gosh, I stay in business at our company um, partly for that reason. I mean, that those were easy examples. But how many times have you seen something of you just see you do data profiling and there's a funny field in there and they say, oh, that X Y Z that means um, that that's a, pri a, a prime customer. And, and we just knew that because that was the easiest way to show it. Seriously, how is someone supposed to know that <laughs> two years from now? Or, or the, this gentleman, you know, part number is what used to be called component number before acquisition. Well, I just know that. Doesn't everyone just know that? Just write it down, put it in a business glossary, metadata repository, metadata catalog, data model, you know, wherever. There's a lot of ways to store metadata, but just document it because that's the type of thing that causes multiple embarrassing issues in, in organizations. Um, a little quote from my uh, cartoon from my book that I like to show that isn't really funny at all, but it's particularly not funny when, until this has happened to you. Okay, we're almost done with acceptance testing. We're running out the application. Just one question, what's a customer? Um, and again, someone can say, well, how hard was that? But anyone who's been on a project, customer is one of the hardest things to define. Uh, again, so many flavors of that. Um, uh, I worked for a, a major corporation that actually had one of these embarrassing items. Um, the definition of is customer someone from marketing? We often use that. I'm going to go talk to a customer. You really mean a prospect or someone who already owns the product um, and sent out kind of renewal notices to people who didn't weren't customers and sent out marketing campaigns to people who were and got those two mixed up. And it was very embarrassing just because what is a customer, right? There was a database. It was the customer database. It was really the marketing database. Big difference, right? Um, a little story I like to tell if you just puts it in context, if you can't get these down, you're going to have a product. So problem. So just imagine, you know, we're all going to go on a family vacation um, and we all have a definition of what a vacation is. I, I think I, for a while, when, when, when one used to go to an airport, <laughs> there was a ad campaign from one of the big banks and it had just the, the only ad was heaven or hell. And it had all these different things like a cruise ship. And one side was heaven, one side was hell, or camping, and one side heaven, one side hell. And depending on you, who you are, um, you could think either one of those is the most horrible thing. So similar to a family, right? The, the father, he wants to take time and, and see every state park and, and learn everything across the country. You know, mom just wants to read a book because she's been busy. You know, Jane wants to go outside to all the state parks and exercise because she's been studying, and Bobby doesn't want to be there at all because he wanted to go out and party with his friends. Cousin Ian from... Um, Ian from uh, the UK, he's like, what's this vacation talk? We call it holiday. I just want to go to the pub. Why am I even here? And Donna, she doesn't care as long as she has her laptop and can talk metadata, right? But just think of the conflict in that car on the right that we couldn't even uh, um, agree on what we want. What, what do we think a vacation is in all the context? And I mean, especially some of the Americans on the call is a common thing to do is decide to drive across the country and see the world. Um, and you've probably had some of those arguments in the back seat or front seat of the car. Um, but just think of that on a project. We're doing a customer relationship management. Well, what's a customer? 
Um, what is a relationship? You know, so really getting to these core uh, concepts early can save a lot of headache down the road, not, not only in life, <laughs> but metadata as relationship management. <laughs> I can start a counseling side business, right? Um, but it just communication is always helpful. Uh, I'll go through a few examples qu quickly. I got, again, we could have a whole week seminar. Uh, this was sort of a highly, uh, we've all heard about this one, perhaps, a pop, I don't want to say popular, was a well-known one, um, NASA. We've all heard of NASA. In 1999, they actually lost 125 million Mars orbiter because of a metadata issue. So when they, they, they sent the figures, um, and the data was in uh, English pound seconds instead of metric units or Newton seconds. Again, a huge difference. We're talking five of something or a million of something um, that can get us much, if you don't know what the, the unit of that something is, you can get much off course. So we know the cost of that one at a minimum was 125 million, talking about ROI, that's a big hole to start with. Um, but just think of the brand and reputation da damage right there. Um, I guess I've been at probably six or seven co conferences where I've heard this example, not a great way to have your brand name NASA you know, shown across the globe. Um, but probably more importantly, think of all the lost opportunities you could have had for research on that Mars climate orbiter, right? So um, just think of things that would happen in your organization. To give NASA some credit, I, I don't like to throw names to the, through the mud, um, they've actually gotten a lot better. If you've ever looked at, you know, now in this new world, um, this idea of open data, there's so many open data sets out there that you can get great information. And they generally all come with really good metadata. So to, to give NASA credit, they've learned from their lesson. And if you look through, there's dozens and dozens of data sets out there or more, and you'll see the units are documented and, <laughs> and everything they've learned their lesson. And it's actually fairly good. So give kudos to NASA for, for having great metadata. Um, just one more story. You'll be probably bored with my stories. Uh, but this is a, a real world example where actually I was doing this for a webinar on self-service data analytics. And the point of the webinar was supposed to be how there's so many great open data sets, you can use these new slick tools and really be a citizen data scientist and, and be a hero really quickly. So I picked this data set um, from a, a UK um, open data set and I thought it would be fun. It was vehicles by make and model um, and accidents, road safety accidents. So I thought, oh, I can, you know, you know, whatever the car is, those Porsche drivers that get in a lot of accidents, but this is the data I got back. What? I don't know. 50 F13 is big. And um, yeah, 20015 BS something was big. I mean, it was it was almost comical. Uh, you, there's no way you can make sense of this because there's no metadata, not only no business metadata of what F13 is. But if you look at even technical metadata, 2100, I can, I can, I can use numbers, 2015. There's a lot of that. Uh, many 2050. That's probably a date. Uh, here it looks sort of like an amount, right? So simple things made this data set completely unusable. Somebody spent a lot of time doing this and now it's completely unusable. It's almost the marketing for your data, right? If you don't have metadata, no one knows what it is. Um, actually, long story short, this was uh, coming full circle. This was I think five years ago. Um, we're actually working with this organization now to fix this very problem. <laughs> I find that really fun. Uh, they maybe they are sort of one of our clients. So unnamed until they fix it and then we'll show them as a success story. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I could go on and on. This is a kind of, just to put this in, all of these things that make you sound crazy, like what is a year, right? There was an international retail chain comparing fourth quarter sales. Generally in fourth quarter, you see a spike because in many um, areas, that's the holiday season, but Latin America didn't see that, that they actually, um, so they're, what can we do? Can we increase marketing? What do we do? You know, all of these issues, when it came down to it, they were talking fiscal year um, instead of calendar year. Again, such a simple thing of just define what a year is. And again, you can sound, doesn't everybody know that we go by fiscal year, not calendar year? Nope, just write it down. And if everybody knows, write it down anyway. Uh, that's the beauty of metadata. Um, to finish this story, give them a little success story. Um, they actually, this fictitious company, actually had great metadata. And Monique talked a lot about the lineage. That can really help with this. So we can look through and see how sales amount was calculated. We can see how which database was calculated, what business rules were used, and really get to that answer fairly quickly. And that's the beauty of some of these tools is getting that context. So you may say, oh, that's great, Donna. That's data warehousing. That's so old school. No one needs annual reports anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we all use big data analytics. Well, even with big data, you still need probably even more so you need good metadata. So I would just say wherever you need good data, you need good metadata. And I will argue 
pill him in the grave on that one. It just, it makes so much sense. You almost don't need to explain it. It's just that that becomes complicated as more as your technical environments become complicated. So yet another story, um, this, and the, uh, all of these are sort of semi-fictional that come from clients that I just don't want to name, um, but uh, big data analytics. So a, a company that uses sort of smart meters, right? And they actually did some analysis, which is really nice. They have smart meters for their homes and, and want to see how using a smart meter can to decrease energy usage over time. So they saw that customers with smart meters used 5% um, uh, um, of, of uh, for each increase in temperature, they had a 5% increase in usage compared with 20% for people with old fashioned thermostats, like the one on the bottom left. So how do they re reach that? How do you know what that even means until you get more metadata? It's almost like all of the questions I have, if you're a data person, you probably have a lot of questions. Well, how did you get that weather data? Was that a monthly reading, daily reading? Was that in Celsius or Fahrenheit, those, the percentage point increase? Um, how did you get those meter readings? Were they the billing meter readings or the actual meter readings? Or, I mean, you could, uh, data people should have a lot of questions, right? And, and was usage by household, individual? How did you do households? Is it by the people living in it, by the address? Lots of different context around even those numbers. So maybe those numbers are right. Maybe they're wrong in your viewpoint. Right or wrong is, is, is this context, right? That metadata in context. I just want to know maybe even a simple thing back to the NASA example. Is that Celsius or Fahrenheit? And those are very different scales. So what do I mean a percentage point of, of temperature, right? So even if we're doing big data analytics, this was a classic IoT data analytics, you still need metadata or even more so you need metadata. Okay, rant over on all of those stories. But um, who uses metadata? I mean, we talked a bit about business users using metadata, um, but technical people need it as well. Auditors need it. Um, almost anybody, I would say, this is a very democratic <laughs> thing. Once it's there, it will be used. So it could be a developer. Um, you know, if I change this field, what else might be affected down the road? I call that impact analysis. Again, you could say, you know, is that really needed? And, and I'm amazed, even to this day, these major companies I work with that still make these very basic issues. So I guess it was two years ago, now, three years ago, major retail chain in, in the US, some well, not well meaning, not thinking a database administrator decided it would be a good idea to shorten the length of the product number to save some space. You can just imagine that broke all the downstream systems. They were actually down, the system was down for a full day as they fixed that and they could calculate how much revenue was lost because they couldn't, people couldn't order product because of a data type length. That was a complete metadata issue, right? I told you I wouldn't bore you too much with all these stories, but each one of these has a real world horror story around um, or success story uh, with people who, who do it well. Um, behind it. You know, we talked about the business person. How do we define regional sales? Um, it could be a, a data architect or a, a citizen data scientist. What uh, There's a lot of data out there. What's the approved data set? How should I store it? Um, and how, do I, how do I map that across? Or I'll just jump to the one on the right. We often forget you know, just a, a regular person. Um, I, I, I join a company who doesn't get confused by the acronyms or how, how the company terminology. Often it's, you know, back to that Wall Street example I had, just having that kind of common lingua franca of a company can be part of your metadata dictionary. So lots of good usages. Uh, governance is a key way to, so metadata supports data governance. Um, again, often a metadata, uh, a data governance task is a, a defining key KPIs and measures, defining core terms, defining lineage, business rules. And so many of the, your typical users or stakeholders in governance use metadata and generate metadata. And, it's an, and you also need governance to manage your metadata well. So it's, again, one of these nice virtual circles that um, is, is used by everybody. And, and you really need all of these people to make it successful because you need to manage metadata just like you manage data and, and not to do one of these, you know, data, metadata is data about data, you know, um, circles, but um, metadata really is data and you need to manage it in, in a similar way. Um, so how do you manage that? There's a lot of things that have evolved. I mean, one way I look like to look at it and Monique had some helpful ways to kind of just, you know, think when I'm looking at a tool, what are the type of features that I need? Because there are a lot of tools or even within tools, they have different features that you may turn on and off. One thing I like to 
think of, and I'm actually facing this at a client now, um, where they're, they're having some conflict of, is the type of metadata management you need more of the encyclopedia approach, where it's, I have a definition of total sales, that's what's going on the annual report, and that is vetted, we got it through governance, and it shall be published, and it's not that nobody can give feedback on it, we want to hear if there's a difference, but it has to go through a fairly governed process, because when you change the definition of total sales, there's a lot of impact to the organization and your annual reports and bonuses and et cetera, et cetera versus something like I am doing some data exploration and we're doing some citizen data analytics. And we want to be rapid and we want to just share, hey, I did a query. That's really cool. What was your definition of, of this and what data sets did you use? I consider that more of the Wikipedia approach. You're sort of, they may all be right by the end. I kind of call that the eventual consistency, right? But, but by over time, we get a lot of voices. Both are really valuable and you may need both use cases within your organization. Encyclopedia might be for your core data, um, re your corporate reports or your master data. Not everybody gets a voice in, in, in your corporate reports, right? Or, or what your master data is. And if you do have a voice, it has to be vetted. Whereas Wikipedia, you don't wanna, that might be, again, I'm trying to do some self-service like analytics and, or a certain department. You don't wanna lock that down so much that someone has to log an issue request just to share a query with someone else when you're working on it. So you don't want to overdo it or underdo it, but give that some thought. I think in, in organizations, as I said, there's a place for both. You just want to do it in the right spot. And, and again, don't over govern uh, stuff that's supposed to be more agile and don't under govern stuff that really should be very closely standardized and governed. Um, so uh, getting a little more into the technical and the how, um, what makes metadata challenging is that there are so many data sources. Um, so Monique mentioned that, I mean, some companies stay in business just by writing scanners or interfaces or collectors or whatever, whatever they're called for these systems. Um, and it, I mean, we still are getting metadata from things like COBOL for, from mainframe, but then there's also, you know, IOT streaming or um, now media files, social media, you can get Twitter metadata. Um, and, and how do I, but, but all of these may have customer information. So there's a business aspect, but there is some genuine challenges and just getting that technical metadata out. Um, this is from a metadata, metadata diversity survey we do each year and you can just see kind of what's what's currently used in the organization, what's planned down the road. And yep, there's a good portion of relational databases, which are fairly simple at this point to scan in. You can just get an ODBC type scanner, um, but there's a lot of other types of, of files now, um, media files and uh, different package applications that may kind of make their metadata difficult to get. So when you're doing your metadata strategy, you really need to think of that scope and breadth of the type of sources you have and, and do some vetting of the metadata tool you're choosing. Um, so it may be that you really knew, do need to get a broad approach on this. And that's really, maybe you're trying to do I don't know, PII analysis or really doing that broad inventory of everything in the organization, you need a tool that can, can do a broad depth of this and, and vet that tool when you're doing a POC. It might be that you're doing overkill and you really just have relational databases and, and heck, you might even use your data modeling tool for your metadata or, or SharePoint or I mean, re really just don't overdo it, but again, don't underdo it as well. And you need to make that decision by the data sources you have. So on that note, there's no one size fits all with anything in life, but particularly metadata management or the tools. Um, and this is just some things to think about. So there is a use case for the one on the left. That's sort of your, I don't know, whatever car you like, your Mercedes or your Tesla or your, your full service vehicle um, that really does everything. There's generally uh, some sort of data catalog or metadata repository, whatever word is used these days, but has some sort of what I call a meta model that says, you know, for all of these systems here, how do I store metadata for, for relational databases versus graph databases versus XML and JSON? There's just different storage mechanisms for that. And they do that hard work for you with these scanners. And I don't belittle that. That's a, a big thing. <laughs> so they can scan that in, generally give it some thought of how they do that matching and reuse logic. I know back in the day, that was really something you had to customize and give a lot of thought to. Uh, like anything in life, things have gotten simpler, but in some ways, that's a bad thing. I sometimes ask vendors, well, I've scanned the database in, and then I changed the table and I want to scan it back in. 
do you match on the name of that column? What if you've changed that name or do you have an ID or, and they say, oh, don't worry about that. We've got it handled. Well, you should be worrying about that because that's gonna happen, right? So kick the tires a little bit. Some cases you don't wanna know, um, have to do all of these things manually, but in some cases you absolutely do. So th think of that. Uh, most of these can sort of publish out in some sort of web-based portal report and kind of share that. So to me, that's almost the one-stop shopping of everything. Um, but also give it some thought, that piece in the middle, sometimes the tool you have has some metadata in it. I, I remember, again, back in the day when I was only, I, I worked for a vendor and I was sort of the metadata repository person that went around the globe doing metadata repositories and worked with companies that literally spent millions on this repository. And when they were scanning in some relational database columns and putting a business definition on it, they could have done that with a data modeling tool. In fact, we were scanning in the data modeling tool that had all that information and um, publishing it out. Or could your ETL tool have just enough data lineage in it? Or your business glossary, if you really just want to start with a business glossary, maybe you start with a SharePoint um, for now, uh, just to get the buy-in and then look at a tool that's more expensive. Um, or even, I love to hate spreadsheets, but even a spreadsheet is better than nothing. So uh, maybe the data dictionary in your database for now is good enough. So uh, you don't have to buy the big fancy thing and you can often scale up. And a lot of these vendors do realize that, that metadata is important and, and have some pretty good in interfaces now. Um, but I also want to talk about the one on the right that often I think gets forgotten, that often there are metadata exchanges or registries or standards across industries that, hey, we're all doing medical data, can we have a common metadata exchange, which I think is a great thing, or metadata registries where you can share not only within organizations, but across organizations, which I think is a really great thing. So, so think of that as you, as you plan. Um, and some of the benefits of doing all that work. And again, you may not need all of these. So think of that when you're looking at a tool, the almost classic one that I called in the beginning was that idea of kind of that data lineage that often, not always, but often comes from a reporting scenario. So I have that, my sales report on the right. I want to know how sales was calculated. And I have sort of on the top, I know it's a busy slide. All of the different things that say you wanted that true lineage would need to be scanned in or, or understood. So what is the measure on the BI tool? What's the business definition, the glossary of sales? Um, what kind of databases or cubes were, were in the warehouse or, or semantic layer? How, what was the staging area? And what do those tables look like? What were the source data? They have source data. They have a physical model. How, what was the naming standards on those? So you could go nuts and a lot of companies do, and it's super valuable because when you do that, business user or technical user, someone says that number is wrong on that report. You click the button and these tools can see why it was quote wrong. In some cases it is wrong. There was an error in the ETL. Some cases it's not wrong. People had a different definition in their head of what sales means or total sales means. What's a region back to that beginning top topic. Um, another one, there's a lot of, I kind of call this relational <laughs> metadata, like the, the relation between other, other things it, um, that you, know, you could have data about a table, you could have data about a glossary and then how do you fit these things together? Um, so one is through data lineage, one is sort of that impact analysis. I showed that example before of the, the person in the retail company changing the name of the product field and bringing down the systems. This could be the same thing. I'm gonna change the name of brand. What else would be affected? And you can look at that before you make the change. Um, so this could be, I have a measure what we're on a BI report, what other reports use this measure, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of that kind of downstream or upstream, I guess, um, analysis. It can be, this should be near and dear to Monique's heart, um, kind of that semantic layers, and this is common in something like a data modeling suite, but not only there, it could be between your glossary and the physical definition. You know, I have a concept called the client, but maybe in the logical model that's called customer, and then on the different databases that's cust, it's customer or C table 1962 or, or whatever, but getting that lineage from the business semantics down to the technical implementation can be another kind of lens to look at your metadata. And, and again, a lot of the tools, some of them have all of these, some of them have none of them, but think of your use case as you're looking at a tool. Um, and I think eventually you do need a tool for metadata. I could draw it on sticky notes, but that would be kind of a limited thing. So I am kind of talking a bit about tools. Um, graph relationships, right? So metadata, in some ways graph, the, is the metadata, um, 
but often some of the benefits of I mean, metadata was in the news for a while. Um, one of my favorite quotes was from a, a friend of mine in Australia sent me a headline, I think it was the Sydney Daily News, and it said, uh, Prime Minister of storms out of meeting for not being invited to metadata talks. I was like, man, that's, and I didn't save the headline either. I'm just killing me <laughs> because what they were talking about, that was, if you remember back with cell phone and, and people were, and people still use that, right? So how do I, I look at patterns of cell phone usage or fraud detection and things like that? In a lot of ways, that is metadata, not always the metadata we're thinking of in databases, but that truly is metadata. And there's a lot of value to that. So uh, a lot of different ways you can use those pattern relationships. Um, so Monique talked about a lot of the changes in the industry. I would agree. Um, AI is used a lot in a lot of things. And, and I think AI is great for th or machine learning, or we misuse those terms a lot, I know. But automating, let's say that. Um, some of the things that back in the day or, or still people have to do manually. So, um, uh, so it could be like, and some of the tools you, you have to say, I want to see where uh, I'm, in, I'm in the U.S. and I want to see my social security number um, all across all the different fields. Do I literally have to do a manual mapping that this field that says SSN links to this field? Um, can I do it by name, maybe? Or what a lot of these machine learning things can look at and say, hmm, if I see three numbers, two numbers, four numbers, probably that's an SSN. Uh, or I can kind of do some pattern matching or fuzzy matching. That can be really, really great. Saves you a lot of time um, from, from manual mapping. But, but again, like everything, you want a place for both methods. Sometimes AI can't, Matt, you might just say, you know, we call our department name for HR, you know, XYZ department. And no, there, there is no mapping for that. That's something you, you defined, right? Um, and so you want to be able, in some cases, have your own mapping rules as well as the pattern match and approach. And again, either one used in the wrong scenario can be bad. You don't want to overmatch on things that may not make sense and you want to have some control over that. I've heard the vendors say that to me as well. Oh, you don't need to know. We'll just do it with the magic. And that should always make you nervous. So sometimes magic is good. Sometimes you do want to be more prescriptive. Um, so again, I, I, I won't go into all of these in detail. I do want to give some time for questions. I know this, I can just see in the chat and Q&A, it looks like there's a bunch, but um, again, I, you've heard me probably talk um, in the name of my company of global data strategy, we do a lot of data strategies, but think of a metadata strategy when you're doing your data, your, your implementation as well. And it's almost the, the cousin of a data strategy. What is the business goal in alignment of a, a metadata strategy? And I've seen companies go wrong. It's so tempting with these tools. I'll walk in with a client and they'll have scanned everything in and, and the metric they're using is we got 4,000 systems in. Great, what are you using it for and who's using it? I don't know, but we have 4,000 systems in. And so I would say, you've probably heard me before, what are those quick wins? What are those quick wins with metadata? Is it a glossary or is it lineage or what systems do you do lineage on? And then what are the second column, what are you storing? What systems do I need to scan in or, or manually put in through a glossary? How am I going to store it? And then how am I going to publish it out? And who's the audience, right? So I've seen, and you can just imagine, some of these lineages, is that a word, line, line I? <laughs> uh, can be really complicated. Probably not what you want to show to the CEO. If they say, how do you calculate total sales? That might be more of a, a glossary term. So think of the different audiences and what display they might want. And then don't forget how are you going to govern that over time? Who are the roles defining governance? What needs to be vetted and monitored? What's more of that Wikipedia approach? And how do you manage quality and progress over time? So hopefully that was helpful. I know we went a mile a minute, but um, lots to cover with metadata. So again, just in summary, metadata, data in context, the who, what, where, and why of your data. Um, you need some sort of orchestration or data governance and metadata not only supports data governance, but you need to govern metadata, here I go in that circle, um, to make metadata successful. Um, lots of different options out there today, and with everything, the more options, the more confusion. So hopefully, didn't cover everything in depth, but gave you enough things to think about. If you're starting a metadata project or looking at a tool, uh, just some questions to ask, um, because you do need metadata, big or small, if you're going to have a successful wider data strategy. So as we open it up for questions, just a reminder, um, do join us next month as we have our guest, Nigel Turner, and we talk about data quality. Um, I did quote a few times this white paper that's available on data diversity, as well as the uh, Global Data Strategy website for a free download. Uh, we do this for a living. If you need help, my blatant marketing plug. 
And now, without further ado, I will open it up to Shannon for questions and comments. Shannon, over to you. Donna, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides and the recording along with anything else requested. So diving in here, uh, lots of great questions coming. Will metadata automation enable identification of enterprise business activity context as the overall enterprise business architecture? A business activity is in, interesting. I think usage patterns can be a bit of, of metadata. I do think there is um, an overlap between, and again, what one person calls metadata, someone else calls something else. There, there's you know, some of the security tools or you know, uh, tools that can kind of look at data passing across the network to say something like where are credit card information being used? And you can actually see that, and, and Monique mentioned that as well, kind of that data in motion can be a really interesting usage. So you might have kind of that static metadata to say even what are those fields that are interesting to track or even see usage. Um, and that might be one way these kind of network scanners that can say people are sending emails about it or, or and or, um, I'm not sure exactly the, the context of the question. Some people have basic metadata metrics of this is a BI report and this is how many people are using this report. And these are the fields that are used the most and kind of do that usage patterns of data is another metadata because that's kind of the context around it. So those are a couple examples that might be helpful. Great, and do you push for uh, class word inclusions in business titles? Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, especially some of these data modeling tools or, or naming patterns to kind of have the, the, the class word um, and, or at least have a, a pattern to it. How do you name things? Is it, I don't know, again, I'm going to go sales revenue or seven news revenue. You put that class word or a keyword ahead, you put it after and just have, I mean, gosh, some of those can be metadata just like when you're organizing some, something. Are we, or, you know, how, how are we pattern, patterning the, the combinations of words? Um, and if we could all agree on that, that even just makes a lot of things easier. So I would say that's kind of more in data standards, but yeah, that could be metadata as well of even the rules around how you do your, your naming components. So we're getting a little, little stretched, but yeah, I, I, that's very valuable. Just how we have those kind of naming patterns goes a long way. And I think we have time for just been a couple more questions, maybe. Um, what are some of the unique considerations that medical research organizations should know about their metadata? Ooh, there's a good one. Um, so we actually seem to be getting a lot more interest from those kind of companies later. Um, so privacy is a big one, right? So um, well, no, knowing how these fields are tagged, knowing the context, say if you're doing a clinical trial, um, that almost reminds me of some of the open data sets. Data in one context has a very different meaning in another context. Um, some context might be more, more static. You know, this is a patient, 42 years old, male. Um, and then, then privacy is, is huge, even if that, that um, you know, you don't use a person's name and there's only one 42 year old male in this town or something. That's probably not a great example, but you know where I'm headed. Um, and then there's also kind of the, the cross organization exchange. Um, and I'm seeing some good progress in that as we share data across medical researches. Um, this is another big area. So it, that was kind of a couple things, hopefully, to keep in mind. Um, yeah. Quick period of time. I would add to that too. Definitely um, within a metadata management solution uh, perspective, that, that's just a, a huge area of value. Um, we, Donna mentioned earlier where she just talked a little bit, little bit, little bit about AI um, as well. And one, we definitely are seeing from a, a, the medical community the need, obviously, to be able to to quickly and efficiently be able to tag data classifications that are sensitive, such as uh, HIPAA or just PII in, in general for a bunch of different protections. Um, the metadata management solutions that are out on the market that are helping data stewards and data, data governance teams doing this um, should be uh, working down the path of using AI and other means to help at least discover within the data landscape where are those fields uh, of, of technical met metadata that would apply? And then again, be able to, to show via the knowledge graphs and data lineage and other, other um, discovery aids 
uh, you know, that, that these, these do apply there and then be able to help the data stewards use AI and other tools to really efficiently and quickly tag, tag those um, based on their judgment, whether or not it is a good fit and, um, and apply all of the policies and rules and so forth um, that should guide the usage of the data. I love it. Well, that brings us right to the top of the hour. Thank you both so much for this great presentation. And thanks to Erwin for sponsoring today's uh, webinar in the series and helping to make this, these webinars happen. Thanks everybody for all the great engagement. Again, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thanks everybody. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks all. Thanks, Donna. Thank you.